Okay, thank you and welcome to our conversation about managed mooring fields. We're coming to you live from the Ambassador Center here on East Blue Heron, and we have separated ourselves. We're six feet apart, and everyone but myself, and I'm quite, quite far back from the rest of the group here, will have their masks on for the entire evening. So this, tonight we're going to talk about the managed mooring fields, plural, three of them, that are proposed for the Lake Worth Lagoon. Excuse me, Sam, could you get the door? Or that, uh, Jeremy, thank you. Um, we are going to talk about the managed mooring fields. John Sprague is our speaker for this evening, and John is the gentleman in charge of this project. John is well, well, well versed in all things marine in, in and around P the Palm Beach area, and has done a lot of work in, on this project, and, and is really the best person to ask all of your questions of. So we're hopeful that we can give you all the information. We want tonight to be interactive, because we really want your questions. We want you to leave this room feeling that that you know everything there is to know about managed mooring fields. So I will say, take it away, John. Is John's mic, uh, mic live? Thank you, John. Hello, can you hear me? Um, I want to thank you for this opportunity. Um, give you a little bit of background. Uh, I was hired by the city some time ago, or my company was, and I've been rebuilding your marina. Um, I used to own the marina where Viking is now. I sold to them in 99. I've been in the marina boatyard business most of my life. And I'm going to interrupt John for one second. I really should introduce our city manager, do you think, really? So this is Jonathan Evans. I, you know, he's just so, just part of everything we do is Jonathan. So Jonathan Evans is also with us. And, of course, my ever-present sidekick, Mr. Sam T.C. Brown over here, my legislative aide. So now, th take it away, John. Thank you. And then as part of that also, I've dealt with the Marine Industry Association of Florida on all boating legislation for probably the last 35 years. I sat on the FWC uh, committee that did the mooring fields, the five pilot program mooring fields around the state, uh, and worked with those cities that developed their ordinances. And they were issued when they were given by the state. They were also allowed to develop reasonable anchoring restrictions. The word reasonable is where you start to get into uh, issues. But I will say the five cities did a very good job in doing it. And unfortunately, when the pilot program was away, then the state took away those, those anchoring uh, restrictions, so they've been operating without them. Uh, Florida, from when I got in the marina business in 61, uh, I remember when I used to go water skiing up to Jupiter, and if I saw another boat, it was rather unusual. Um, it was rather unusual. Uh, we all know what boating is today. Uh, Florida leads the country in the number of registered boats, the largest economic impact, along with a few other uh, accolades goes with it. It's about a $25 billion industry in the st for the state of Florida. Uh, it's something I've enjoyed and my kids as well. The problem that's kind of gotten and grown over the years, I call, we're going back to the old Garwood days, um, is that the price of building marinas today, but not only that, the permitting issues of even finding locations that you can build marinas today is getting tougher and tougher. Most marinas, when they've expanded, have reduced slips because the demand is for bigger and bigger boats, and that's where the money is. So in order to build with the restrictions of riparian lines, how close channels are, etc. Most marinas that are rebuilding today are going smaller. So to give an example, most marina slips today are about $100,000 to $150,000 up to build a slip. So whether it's a city that owns it or a free enterprise that owns it, you know, they kind of look at a return and whatever on investment. And what do you have to charge for a slip that costs that much to build, even if you can amortize it over 20 years? So the price of slips have continued to go up. And what's that done? It's taken a lot of average people, working class people, cannot no longer afford $1,000 up for a slip per month. And a lot of, therefore, a lot of boats are being stored. And this is not a problem just the Florida. This is all over the country. Uh, secondly is, is, as we know, we get a lot of hurricanes that uh, cause a lot of damage to boats. Insurance companies have habit of, of uh, totaling them. 
and letting somebody take it over and oftentimes they wind up on our waters um, anchored out and people are living on them and they have no way of navigating. Uh, those are your derelict vessels today. Uh, a derelict vessel is incapable of navigation. That is the first and primary thing that law enforcement looks at. Uh, secondly is, is you have what's known what we call at-risk vessels. And a lot of times those are stored vessels that the owner no longer uses and it's kind of like out of sight, out of mind. And unfortunately, uh, two things happen to the derelict and at-risk vessels over time. They either sink or they wait for the next storm event to come, uh, as we had a few weeks ago, and they wind up in somebody's front yard, either their seawall, their docks, or our marine facilities. Uh, we just had five of them uh, that are waiting to come out of the water in Riviera. And I think the price we've got to take them out is 41,000 and change, which uh, trying to find some grant money. I got some secured, but uh, unfortunately the taxpayers of Riviera are gonna wind up with a good chunk of that to get them out of there. So, Managed mooring fields, an average mooring field is about $3,500 installed. May cost a little bit more if you want uh, a stronger mooring. Uh, they make them up to uh, 100,000 tons. Uh, so, you know, there's a wide, wide span. There is a drawing here somewhere that shows you what a typical mooring is. Um, the regulations by the agencies don't want any part of the mooring being able to touch the bottom. And one of the problems with anchoring out, uh, and trust me, I've anchored for more years than I would care to count. Um, I'm quite sure I've done my share of chain and anchor damage over the years, is that the boat goes around in a circle with the wind and tide, and as it does, it drags that chain in that same circle, depending upon how long the chain is and how shallow the water is and how big the anchorage is and what the holding power is. So subsequently, when you have a mass of boats in areas like ours where our water quality is generally good because we have a deep water inlet, um, we wind up with massive scours to the bottom. It's part of boating, but what we look at with mooring fields is an alternative to anchoring on an anchoring chain so you stop the damage to the bottom and the resource, number one. Number two, when you go through a permit process, they're gonna require us to put in a, a pump out boat and be honest with you, I don't understand why Palm Beach doesn't have a boat, a pump out boat many years ago. Nothing to do with the mooring field uh, because people, if they're not in a marina, need to go into a marina. And part of the problem with that is, you know, if you want to anchor good, it takes quite a bit of time to get your anchor set really good and your chain set really good. And it's not something that you want to just go ahead and pull, depending upon how many times you want to pump out. So as part of the regs on a mooring field, we will have a pump out boat, at least one, and we might have two, depending upon how many moorings we wind up with. I'm also looking at doing a, a I want to call it a, an Uber, or the uh, cost-free Uber um, that services the mooring fields. And what that does is alleviate the dinghy issue. You know, where do you take your dinghy? Is somebody gonna steal my dinghy while it's gone? You know, these are things that when you're cruising, you worry about. Um, and then secondly, it, it just, it makes it much easier. We don't have the, especially with transit boats, there's no parking issues and whatever which means it helps with those because we often find dinghies in yards and necessarily places where the residents and other people that have waterfront property don't necessarily like them. So that's another thing that we, we hope to do. Um, so where are they at? And, and so first of all, what we did, we did side sanding sonar and I keep a complete bathymetric of all three locations. The first being generally the code the cove at Bill Foster. And I remember when that mooring field tried to go in. Uh, there was a lot of opposition from the homeowners. Uh, some people on the waterfront, and I'm a waterfront homeowner, and I understand that issue, do not want to see boats anchored out. 
but unfortunately, that's part of navigation. And you know, if you come from New England, where I come from, well, I always thought they were kind of picturesque to have sailboats out there. What I don't want them is my front yard, however. So, you know, we understand the problem, but view corridors and the ability to navigate, we navigated for a couple of hundred years in this country before we ever built roads that we moved around on. And so a lot of laws having to do with navigation go back to when we didn't have roads and we didn't have cars. Uh, we were on horseback or we moved things by boat. Um, so when we looked at it, where do we put them? So Phil Foster, um, initially, I think that, that Sugar Sands did have a good part to do. Uh, and of course, the houses on the east side, you know, they're all concerned. I got these boats and, you know, they're going to come in. Well, we kind of looked at the mooring field. First of all, when a boat anchors off of your house or your condo or whatever, you have no control over what kind of an anchor, what size line, how, you know, size of the cleat. There's no regulations at all that police that activity. Where the moorings are going to be engineered. Uh, part of it, the company that installed these have already given me a rough price for a monthly maintenance program that they will dive the moorings on a continual basis, change whatever parts are needed, because those parts are rubbing against themselves all day long. Uh, we also intend to oversize the moorings, and the moorings basically will be set up according to certain size boats. Every buoy will be numbered. Um, it has a permit right on the buoy because there has to be a complete permit application that goes through the Army Corps and DEP. And DEP is a permitting agency for the state and they own the bottom land where all three of these mooring fields are proposed. So it's not just regulatory looking at seagrass and whatever in permitting, it's also they have proprietary rights because they own the bottom. And it's in the public trust doctrine on the decisions that they made on the bottom land having to do with the public. So then we had some hurricanes in 2004 and 2005. And you know, I wish I'd kept some of the stats, but I know there was at least a couple boats wound up on, I think, the docks. And I'm not sure whether one climbed the seawall on the west side or not. I was hoping somebody that lived in that, that lived that lives on the uh, west side of that cove is here tonight that had a boat wound up on there uh, from the hurricane. Then we had 205 as well. Um, like I said, we just had that brief little storm, which wasn't even a hurricane, and we had five of them that came in and damaged things at the marina, wound up on the park, and we've got a lot of pieces that are down below on the bottom, aside from what it does to the boats that were anchored out. Um, so that's of concern. So that is the number one mooring field. And I think also, and, and let me explain, this is probably going to be a one-year process before we receive these permits. Uh, they're going to look at grass. There, you know, there's public input in them. Um, we've got very in, various depths. We don't have that problem there. We've got plenty of water. But the other two areas have different depths. So every mooring is going to be set, you know, is there a state navigation for at least six foot vessel to tie? What's the scope of the length of the vessel? Got to make sure we don't interfere with the right of ways of the channel, uh, the individual channels that come from, from in and out of the marinas. Uh, and that's along the mainland between the ICW and um, everybody's homes and commercial facilities on the mainland side between the city marina and the Blue Heron Bridge. The third one is south of the Turning Basin between the, the uh, south end of the deep area of the Turning Basin and down to about 42nd Street where Rybovich is. Um, and there's two channels. There's one, um, the U.S. Uh, Army Corps uh, Atlantic Intercoastal Waterway Channel on the west side. But there's actually a Palm Beach channel down the other side that's deeper than the Atlantic Intercoastal Waterway. Uh, the big super yachts that go on the Rybovich actually use the Palm Beach channel and not the ICW because of the depth. That area, however, there's a lot. There's shallow areas in the no northwest corner. It's got some deep stuff in the northeast. It varies with 
steps. So therefore, on a case-by-case -case basis where each mooring is going to be intended to be go, and that will be a GPS for its exact location, um, those will be based on what kind of water depths can we have, how is the boat going to get into that particular mooring without running aground. And so there's going to be a lot of design work. That's, that's probably the toughest of the three because the shallowness is not in one area. It's, it's, it's intermittently all around. So there won't be any uniform layout of the moorings. They are just going to be intermittently put. But I will say all of them are going to have a lot of distance in between. Uh, when I say a lot of distance, there's, there's uh, you know, a 50, 40 foot mooring, we're probably going to have at least 150 feet, and that may even grow. Uh, part of that is we're going to look at how many moorings do we think we need for today, how many do we think we need in the future. And the other part of that, if, if you know how they're put in, there's helices that screw into the bottom. And you keep adding lengths to the helices until you reach a hydraulic pressure based on what you're looking for to take the load of the boat that's designed for that mooring. And that depends upon the bottom, you know, how soft it is, is it sand, is it mud, is it clay, what is it, do you have rock? And so those moorings will be varying uh, depths and lengths of the helices to make sure that they meet the loads that they're intended to do, and that's all engineered by engineers. Um, so when you look at the drawing for the south side, it doesn't show any of the moorings because we haven't got to that point to be able to pinpoint where each one are going. The other thought process is, is that we know we have fluctuations between season and, and non-season and Florida and boats. Um, so if you're gonna have moorings that are not going to be used for long periods, it makes sense to unsnap them from the heel of sea in the bottom and you load them up in the boat and you take them in and you store them and so you always have enough to try and keep up with demand, but that doesn't mean that all the moorings are going to be in. Um, and you just put them in over time. But what you don't want to do is have the city have to go through an extensive um, seagrass study and all the things that have to be done to permit any additional ones. Um, we also have setbacks. We've kind of designed them t uh, based on the setbacks. I think I said sugar fans was going to be like 150 feet to the nearest. It's probably going to be a minimum of 250 feet to the nearest boat. Um, and we've left at least 200 feet of channel all the way around the mooring field. So on top of the ability to go through because there's big distances between the boats, because all the boats there are generally going to be going the direction with the tide coming in or against. Very seldom, I think, are you going to find the wind controls more than the tide does there. So they're all going to be in a line generally. So there's plenty of room to go in between them to navigate. But there is a large amount of, like I said, at least 250 feet before you get to the docks or whatever, seawalls is protection. Um, the ones that are along the city of Riviera Beach side, um, we've got various channels. Rybovich's channel, um, Lockheed Martin's, Vikings got two channels, uh, Newport Cove, um, I think that's uh, the boat ramps, um, and then the houses on the north. Uh, we've looked at those channels, and we've just got some moorings that will go in between the channels, between those areas. Now, the question is, why would you want to do that? Well, first of all, people that are especially cruising, but people that want to store their boats, you know, it's the dinghy issue and where they park the car. Well, of course, the main hand land is close proximity to our city marina that's going to operate the mooring fields. And we will have some kind of parking uh, that they're going to be able to utilize, hopefully a parking garage somewhere down the line uh, for the marina complex and, and all the restaurants and whatever. Uh, but also, uh, we thought we'd use that great deal for transit because they can easily get to the stores and Publix and all those things along there. Uh, some on Phil Foster because we have public transportation 
on Blue Heron. Uh, so they can they can get on buses and transfer or whatever and get to wherever they need to go and enjoy Palm Beach County. Uh, that's not a hard and fast, you know, because we're going to have different size boats and depending upon what the demand is on any one given time. But also, mooring fields are like a marina. We're going to have rules and regulations, you know, noise and all kinds of things that. Uh, because we do realize they're on waterfront, and as everybody knows, sound over the water travels uh, very easily. And a mooring field is kind of no different than any other housing complex or whatever we put in the city. We kind of look at how do you protect your neighbors. So because it is owned by the city, I think there's going to be a fair amount of control uh, based on, you know, we want a mooring field that enhances our city and not, not one that detracts from our city. Uh, let me see, am I missing, am I missing? Yeah, there should be, um, Sammy, do you get, can you get those pictures and then you can see what I've, uh, doesn't matter which one you come up with first. All right, that's, that's the main land of Riviera Beach. The white stripe is your ICW. And then you've got uh, a buffer zone. Uh, the, you've got red moorings and yellows, and the difference between those are the uh, depth of water and the size of the boat that they're going to be able to carry. And you notice some like down here, there's only two, and there's two the next one. There is a big section, and part of that is because of the public boat ramp and all that property there and Mart Marietta and whatever, um, that looked like a pretty good area. The other thing you got to remember when these go in um, is that by doing that, there's a lot of shallow water just to the west of those moorings. So that was one of the things that controlled where they go along with the reds. Uh, we also kind of control anchoring in those areas because it keeps the boats out of the ICW. And like I said, right down here in the corner is where we had the five of them come in from that storm that we had a couple of weeks ago. Um, one went into Viking as well, sailboat. Um, and of course, that can happen as it gets, uh, depending upon the storm and the event and the size of the storm. Uh, you know, if you get a Cat 4 or a Cat 5, you know, we're going to have so much damage. It's, uh, but even the City Marina, we built that with massive concrete floating docks that survive um, hurricanes pretty well. Um, uh, Sam, go ahead. Is there, uh, while this one is, well, let's wait a little question. Go to the next one. And then uh, we'll I have a question first, John. Yeah. How, how can I, if I have a boat that I don't want to use the mooring field, but I want to just anchor it, how far away from the mooring field do I have to be? All right. There's a limit right now in law that says you cannot anchor with 125 feet of the perimeter of the mooring field. But these moorings are also designed so when you make your circle, you're not right on the edge or perimeter of the mooring field. Um, because we want to make sure everybody can navigate within the perimeter because like the south one, there's some shallow water outside the, the perimeter. But within the perimeter, there's enough room to navigate. So on a case-by-case -case basis, that's going to vary how close the boats are to the perimeter. But there will be perimeter buoys that mark exactly where the, you're into the mooring field and where you're not. And presently in state law, it says 125 feet. You cannot anchor um, within that, and you cannot anchor inside. Does that board. include if that prohibition against anchoring? Does that include liveaboards? Doesn't matter who you are. Okay. So we couldn't have a situation where, for, and I'm, I think most people are interested in the next picture. I don't mean to hurry you along, but the picture that shows the mooring field that's in front of Sugar Sands, what that means is you couldn't have a liveaboard anchored on the uh, east side of the mooring field between the mooring field and Sugar Sands. That's, that's the intent, okay. and that's why we designed it the base, base we are. And I will tell you that I will be working on some legislation that in an FWC has already been presented to them that I want to increase that 125 to at least 250 
and we may increase it to 500. I'm not sure. It depends upon, you know, uh, when you get into bill language, there's, uh, it can get difficult. Right. So doing that would inevitably reduce the number of boats that are just anchored out there and increase the number of boats that utilize the managed mooring field, thus increasing the, li the likelihood that we'd have clean, cleaner water because those boats would be mandated to be pumped out. Well, and, and you know, we've, we've designed it the, for what it is now, for protection to the waterfront homeowners and businesses, as well as create the mooring field. Um, if, in fact, during the uh, next session we can actually spread that, that will allow us, if we want to, to even get more distance between the houses and whatever, because like I said, it's going to take us a year to get through the permit process. You can always reduce it. I mean, there's some agencies that don't like boats at all. Uh, if they had their way, you couldn't permit anything. Um, but. Um, so I think this is probably a wor well, I know it is. It's a worst case scenario based on design now. Okay. And if anything, the moorings will go down in numbers and they're not going to go up. But we also had to look at, we may need two pump out boats. We got the water taxi boat. So, you know, they're probably 12 hour shifts. So, you know, we're probably gonna have about five people on payroll just to take care of mooring fields at least um, based on hours. Uh, and then you have fuel, maintenance on the boats, the cost out front and whatever. So of course, no different than the city mar marina, we want the marina, the mooring field to make money for the city, not cost money to the city. And at the same time, great improvement to the environment. Uh, if we can stop all the seagrass damage and make sure that there's no sewage dumps um, because we'll pump them out on a regular basis and collect trash, uh, there's not, you know, there, the other thing, let me talk about liveaboards for a minute. In state law, the definition, the main definition that we're going to deal with is that you are a liveaboard if that boat is your only domicile. If not, it's a boat in navigation. And uh, you're not a liveaboard, you are an occupied vessel under Florida state law. So, you know, most of our trouble boats, and, and I have to say too, an ugly boat is not derelict and it's not necessarily at risk. Um, you just don't necessarily have the money to make it look like a, a new million dollar yacht. Uh, but they are, we put into law year before last, last year, I lose track with this COVID. Um, where basically law enforcement now has the ability to look at an at-risk boat. And what is that? You know, may have a lot of barnacles in a water line, might be listing, hatches missing, no mast. You know, various things to say, you know, this appears to be an at-risk vessel and either is derelict, but we, we haven't determined it yet, or it's on its way. And they're going to tell the owner of that boat um, to set up an appointment, and he's gonna have to navigate that boat for a distance timed and then turn around and navigate back and if he can't do it that boat's going to wind up being derelict either that he's got so much time to pass the ability to do that um, sounds draconian but you know we keep trying to deal with this issue and sever separate the ones that can't afford a thousand dollars a month but they're trying to do everything right it's just that they're out there on state waters from the ones that are not. Um, you know, we get, well, you know, people never pump out or whatever. And yeah, there are some boats out there that don't ever pump out. Um, we find if people use the boat, it doesn't take very long, especially if they're gonna burn fuel to go into a marina and get a pump out. Uh, fortunately, with the city marina, we've got pump out at every single slip in that marina, so you don't even have to leave it. And that allows a great deal of the marginal dockage of that marina that you can up to and get pumped out without a problem and we pump out boats for free of charge at the city of marina um, so uh, you know like i said you know the city's come a long way in trying to improve our waterfront our water quality you know that's why people come to the water is because of fish and seagrass and all the critters that we have and so there's 
there's voters I know that are going to be concerned about. I've been anchored there for ages, and I'm going to move my place to anchor, and you know, what's it going to cost, and whatever. I will tell you, if I have anything to do with it, they will be very reasonable fees that get charged to the mooring field, because our capital costs are not that high. Um, our operating costs, but if you have enough boats on the mooring fields, that amortizes those costs. Um, so I would suspect that, that, you know, because I've seen moorings where they, you know, they want $50 a night to tie up your boat on a mooring. You know, a mooring only costs $3,500. I'm not so sure that's very reasonable. Um, but on the other hand, when free enterprise does that, and a lot of places put in mooring fields, jack up the prices because they really don't want the boats. And that's the way, because if you don't have those anchors, areas to anchor in, in the community, and you charge so much money, and then the boats have to go somewhere else. Um, anything else? I could we switch the picture? Yeah, switch the drawing. Okay. All right, this is, can you shift it up a little bit so you can just see the uh, sugar sand story? Keep going if you can. Keep going. Right there. That's good. All right, so this is the maximum number. We tried to move as many moorings out to the west, and even though they're more exposed, because you can see where the land is or whatever, we tried to keep most of it as far away from the condos and the houses as we possibly can. So if you look at, at where the moorings are and where the docks are way over here, they're there's an average, this one's got 120 feet between those two. And like I say, in this process, and if that's 120, you can see how far it is to the bulkhead of sugar sand. That's why I say there's at least 250 feet that we're designing in there for, for a, a distance off. Um, that's a maximum number of moorings. Um, I haven't even counted. I'm not sure how many are there. 13. But there are, you know, like I said, we're in for permitting process, it depends upon, but, you know, hopefully the residents understand that the way it is now, there could be 250 boats out there and you have no control over any of it. And then also, you know, you, there's old seawalls in that area too, and they're not real good for boats bumping into them. Um, and it is a hurricane, you know, we're, we're the most further east point in the state of Florida. So our nose is kind of stuck out there for hurricanes when they make their swing. Uh, we've just been lucky since uh, 205 not to have anything serious, a couple close ones. Um, but if anything, I, like I said, those numbers may go down. We may find we have too many or whatever, or that's not the best. We can reduce some there. Uh, we have a lot less control over the third mooring field to the very south. And the reason, reason being is, is that there's um, city of Riviera only goes to the south end of the FPNL plant, and that takes care of a chunk of that that southern area south of their turning basin, but it doesn't do all of it. So I haven't heard yet, um, even though they they kind of know about it, but the town of Palm Beach and the town of West Palm may get involved on the mooring field, but. Most of the people I've talked to, when you look at preserving, you know, if you care about the environment and, you, you know, the water bodies and whatever, and, and if those boats go through, there were at least one went into Rybovich. I'm not sure. I don't have any stats on whether or not any of the other ones in that area uh, wound up on the mainland of West Palm or not. Uh, but, and there's some very good boats out there. Uh, there's some nice boats. Yes. Cover. Um, I'd like to know if you're going to require insurance for the uh, boats tied to these moorings that if we have a storm or any kind of problem that the boat owners uh, will have the insurance to pay for the problems that might happen in a storm. Uh, 
to get their boat picked up off the bottom or perhaps take care of damage that they might do to somebody's property or other boats on the water? There's a, that has not been thought through. Um, you know, we've worked on that for years on, in the legislature how, on how to deal with that. One of the problems is a lot of the older boats, you can't get insurance for them regardless. I mean, you can't even buy insurance. Um, so that's the number one problem. Of course, the number two is, fine, all the boats that are anchored out there, there's no control. They can continue to damage the bottom, do the whatever. Uh, and if we maintain or mandate insurance, you know, how many boats are just going to move somewhere else and continue to anchor and not be in the moorings? Well, but like that I mean, is something which we are going to look at because we require insurance at the marina. Of course, we got to have also have a right now it's about a twenty-five million dollar investment, and it's going to be a great deal more than that when we finish it. Um, but that is part of it to talk to the insurance companies and and. You know, maybe we can get a blanket pot. I don't know. All right, but, let me tell you. That is on the list. But you want to know some, somebody. My, my grandfather built the second dock south of Sugar Sands in okay. 1952. Our family has been there for 68 years. Yep. We did have damage during the storm of 2004 and 2005. Sailboats came in, wiped out the dock. We had two, uh, two you know, one storm we had Francis. Three weeks later, we had Gene. We had boats come in and damage the seawall the dock, none of them had insurance. So I've been, we've been dealing with that issue out there, and it's very, very frustrating. I think this field is a very good idea. I, I mean, I really like it, I support it. I think it's a little too dense, and I wanna to talk to you specifically about the distance you know, from our property. Um, but I, you know, I support it, but I do think it's definitely too dense at this point. And that may be, I'm not, all I know is that when I go in for permitting, I never get more than what I ask for, and I generally get less. So you kind of come in with a max, and then in dealing with the problem, which is part of it is dealing with residents and you know the city itself and everything else to make sure there's a there's a a proper deal. Um, we will work on that, and you know, listen, I I am more than happy to meet with any of you individually, especially you know the ones that are right on the water that we know are affected. Um, and like I said, this is going to be a long process. We haven't popped, I keep hoping that we're going to get these permits applied for, but we, you know, we're, we're still working out the details and the management plan, the things that we know DP are going to ask for. Uh, but right now, whatever is proposed is definitely subject to change, and it definitely will not be more than what's up there now. John, just from your, from your knowledge of the marine world here, what percentage of these moorings that you have proposed will actually be put into place, say, in the next two to five well, years? Well, I would like to think that with the, with the pickup boat and, you know, the amenities that we're trying to do in the downtown and whatever, and, and I would like to think that we're going to increase our transient vessel traffic uh, with high-end transient boats. Uh, you know, when we look at what Rybovich has done or whatever, our waterfront is changing all the time for the better. Um, so I can't answer that question. Right now, I think that we'll lose at least 50% of what's there. Not the south mooring field necessarily, um, but, you know, right now there's not too many. I counted uh, 104 south and about 24, 25 along the mainland and Phil Foster. When I did the study, don't ask me when I did that, but uh, it was a number of months ago. Those numbers change all the time. So it's basically the same when I counted them. Uh, I just want to say that she said for the purpose of those who are trying to hear, there were 25 boats uh, recently outside of Sugar Sands. Vic has I, ha I have a statement and a question. Are you aware that Sugar Sands is in the process now of spending four, up to $4 million on a new seawall? We have concerns just on that alone. The people are looking out at what we have now in the mooring field 
and we've had bad experiences with boats breaking loose and coming into our old seawall. Now we're going to have a new one within the next couple of months. And the fear is that they're going to break loose in a storm and come flying into our new seawall. Four million dollar investment that's being paid by every resident of Sugar Sands is nothing to sneeze at. I don't think there's anybody in Sugar Sands that wants this mooring. The questions that I have been asked are, why the density? Why so many there? We don't have good water flow. I can go on and on. Your presentation got me so hopped up about questions that I want to ask. There's a little, there's a, a reef out in front of Sugar Sands called the Sugar Sands Reef. Nobody bothered with it. If we have affluent coming out of these boats, that's going to affect that. Now, let me ask you this. I have a file here that's stick with correspondence from the mooring field that was presented in 2004. And I was part of the committee that fought that. I have DEP, EPA, I got all kinds of letters in here, and it was defeated because questions could not be answered and guarantees could not be made. I would like to sit down with you and go over this file and show you half the people that helped with this are now deceased. One's in jail <laughs> who happened to be a, a Palm Beach County commissioner. Yes. And I have the correspondence to prove all this. First, first of I don't all, understand, I don't understand why the density here. I'm we're not happy with what we have now, but we're certainly not going to be happy with this. Uh, could, I, could I make a suggestion? I, I, wait, one second, one second. I know there are a lot of people. Raise your hands if you're for Sugar Sands here tonight. Okay, so would it be helpful if John, and I'm happy you're all here tonight because I, know, I knew you would have a lot of questions. Would it be helpful if we scheduled a meeting just for Sugar Sands over in your meeting area as long as we can make it separate like this so that more people can come and so that you can answer, you can ask questions specific to the Sugar Sands? The, wait, 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 let me yeah. if, I, if I could, though, just to leave you with one thing. So the mooring field never went in. No. So all these boats on anchor that we know drag whenever you get high winds, yep. no, no. they stayed instead. No, here's our problem. When we've had them crash into our seawall, there was nobody that took responsibility for getting them out. You know who had to get them out? People that had boats would tie up to them, tow them back into the mooring field, dump the anchor, or tie them off some other way. That's not our responsibility. We have no phone numbers, no names of people to call, and we went back and forth for almost five or six days till the lagoon keepers helped us out. And we totally understand that. It's up to the state of Florida. They own that bottom lamp. But with... I, we know they do. You're going to say 113 moorings are going to be less damage to the environment than what's there now? Well, yeah. tell me how they, they yeah. do the environment. You collect their sewage. If you look at a mooring, there's nothing touches the bottom. There's no lines. But you're not no talking chain. at all about the boat traffic or the, the, the traffic of all the Uber things you're talking about, the sewage, all no those sewage. things. You're, you're assuming out. that everybody's going to pump out their boat. Oh, they will or they won't stuff. be in the mooring uh, field. John. Yeah. I've been reading that Thank these you. municipalities actually, when they plan a mooring field, figure a percentage of the boats that will not pump out. Well. A percentage. And because they will, I've been voting 50 years. They will pump out in a marina. They'll pump out there. Now, let's regulate it. No one has regulated our marina. I've been there 25 years, and it has hardly been regulated. As far as pump out? No, 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 not pump out. I'm talking about if you got a problem in our marina, nobody will come enforce the rule. Who's going to enforce the rule and even find out about dumping sewage? I think that's a question that Mr. Evans needs to or, look into. Or, John, one more question. The noise. We get a southeasterly wind. We can hear noise from the two drunken goats 
coming, coming north. You put 80 or 113. The newspaper said 80. We're up to 113. Put 113 boats. You will hear people talking all over the harbor. It'll blow right at us. First of all, a lot of these boats, and we will control, and you can have a lot of input into this, where the occupied boats go versus the stored boats that will be spread between the three anchoring systems. So in other words, if you're not moving your boat, you're going to go over here. But if you're just mooring it there for a couple of days. Yeah, and I'm not saying we'll do that 100% off, off Sugar Sands in that area. You know, at, at the but you can, con it may be a very small percentage. We will regulate that, John. The, we have, we're, we'll have a harbor master just like the city marina does. At, at the webinar was discussed, and I don't think I missed it. I've been thinking about this for a long time. They mentioned X number of dollars to keep your boat there on a monthly basis. What are we going to charge for an overnight? Somebody comes in the inlet, wants a mooring, ties up. Two days later, they're on their way north or on their way south. Correct. Nobody said how much they're going to charge for that. Nobody said how they're going to uh, uh, put them, uh, the insurance on them. I heard insurance was going to be mandatory. I said, well, that's a good thing. Now I haven't heard that, but it is on the management plan on my, uh, the deal, my, trying to figure out whether it, what we're going to do during the process. My big question to you is, this file is loaded from 2004 up to 2006 when this was totally turned down. What's the difference between what you want to do on this mooring field and what they wanted to do in 2004? And don't tell me regulations. I can't tell you what they, they were going to do in 204, much. but I can tell you based on the new marina and the operation of what we do there, that there will be a great deal more control on exactly how the mooring field is run, the kind of boats that we take, the rules and regulations that will be ahead of time that you have to comply with. I mean, we pump out all the boats. We pump out the boats at the marina, no charge. Why did you come up with this number? Which no, what number? I really didn't. It's the, en it's the engineer. Basically, I told him to look at each area, look at the water depths. I want a certain amount of minimum setback from, from property owners on both sides. I know I got the channel. I got from a boat ramp, how much room do we have for everybody to navigate, whether or not they're going north or whatever. And then from there, put moorings in with this amount of separation. I mean, we can click the mouse and say we want another 25 foot on every circle, and it, you know what happens automatically. Instead of being so dense, John, why can't you push them uh, south from Sugar Sands? Take out a few roads. If you got 113 and you got a 100 down south of the bridge, why are we trying to fill every square inch? And, and we're Part of that was is because I'm used to getting knocked back in a permit process and building water access, number one. Um, I don't disagree with you. This was a starting point. I knew we were going to have these town hall meetings. You know, then I've got permitting agencies up to whatever that we have to deal with. Um, and all those will sometimes reduce or whatever. Uh, but I'll definitely take that into consideration. We may not need anywhere near that number in that area. John, but I've also I got to try and look at what is the overall cost, and that will be developed as we go through the process. What is the potential revenue that we will have? And what is our capital cost? What is our operating cost? And what does the revenue look like <laughs> to make it self-sufficient for itself? Wait, 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 wait. I, have, I, I want to try to do this in a way that we can use the microphone for people who are listening. And I have a question, then this young lady, then this gentleman, young gentleman in the front, and then I'll go back there to you. So my question is, would it be possible to start filling the mooring fields with the ones to the south and see how that goes and, you know, and, okay. then, and then say, okay, it looks like a lot of these people are... are, well, are well, the other thing is, is that even when we get our permits and whatever that number is um, we've been working very hard and we've done very good on the amount of grant money that we've gotten to help 
so we have very few city dollars that have gone into the marina compared with grant matching dollars that we've been able to obtain. That's one of the reasons why we've taken so long to build it, because we can only get so much grant money each year. Even if we have, let's say we permit, whatever that number is, 350 boats, whatever that number is, does not mean we're going to put 350 more in and come in for the top, because the wear and tear and everything else will start immediately. We will only put in, you know, if there's 25, there, there apparently seems to be like 25 boats all the time off of your condo. So I would say that we'd probably start with like 30 moorings, somewhere in that area. Now the helices will be in for more, but that does not mean that we will utilize and pay for the entire mooring field up front because there again, it's taxpayer money. And what we don't want is mooring sitting out there deteriorating and not being used. Okay, we have a question. Yes, hi, John. Hey, neighbors. Uh, we, we not live in Sugar Sand, but we live on the east side of the park. So this is really a real experience when even just storm, not hurricane, even storm. And on the west, uh, northwest corner, the, the wind's very strong. So it's few occasions, the, the sailboat will rush to our dock. And in the ranging rain and storm, we have to rush outside, try to save the, save the sailboats and ri risk our life. So I think it's, for, it's not for the view. Most important is for the safety. And that's what a mooring does Thank versus you. an anchor and a line and chain that we have no control how big the anchor is, how well it's set, how much road there is on the rope. We have zero control on all those. The difference is, is saying that a boated anchor versus one that we put in a marina, that the ones in the marina are going to do the exact same things as the one on anchor when there's a storm, and that's not true. Well, John, we have the public boat ramp there also, with all yeah. these boats coming in. We can, you don't have that in the south. Where you put them south, you don't have a public boat ramp. So we're already dealing with extra boating there we already. We do have the boat ramp which, on the which south one, of which the one? Field. The one you put in now? Yeah, but it's further, it's yes, close. Yeah. It's the same. Yeah. It's the same distance as what it is back from Sugar uh, Sands. I mean, we're dealing with we're dealing with 25, 30 boats now, which is already a problem. You want to put 113 boats in our backyard? But those that's boats. Problem. Well, I mean, I've seen a lot more than 25 over the years that have been. And that's a, and that's a, and that's a problem as it is. The 25 we have there is a, it's an eye. It's, 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 it's a what? It's, it's everything. I mean, people just don't take care of their boats. They just leave them out there. But the same thing you're gonna have here. Because there's no control over. I can't tell you how many. And of you those say are you say the city's gonna know. you say the city's gonna patrol it. They don't do nothing for it about it now. They could care less. You call them, they say it's not their problem. We are wrestling not only with the problems that Riviera Police Department have. We got the same problem with FWC. Um, we have an overall. So why don't they help us? The city does not control anchoring. No, we're gonna. The city will control the mooring field, and then that land is leased by the city, and then becomes under control of the city. It sounds to me like we have an issue. Operation by the city. It sounds to me like we might have an issue at the marina that maybe Mr. Evans needs to look into. Were you saying earlier, sir, that you had that you didn't feel that the marina, that the harbor master was always paying attention? I, I m might have missed that, and then I'll go back here. Well, there's someone. Uh, what's the name of the har the the name of the harbor watcher or something that nobody can? No, no, he's harbor master. Oh, what's he? Anyway, but there's the a harbor point. master's lead. Okay, uh, I forget the. Uh, we've heard a different name, but, but, but anyway, I have history on the harbor because I probably have been there more long. I've been there 25 years on that seawall. The average number of boats has really not changed. We've always had about that number, and then hurricanes. We've had a few boats to the seawall, but hadn't damaged our seawall, but. The problems we've had in 25 years don't equal the noise from a boat that will be, you'll be sitting there in the afternoon or in the evening, and you will hear the noise from those boats. 
How many, bo how many votes are <coughs> occupied over there? Does anybody know? Two. two. So there's two votes to make all that noise? Yes. No, no, I'm going back. No, 113 votes. Yeah, exactly. And three. Okay, okay. <coughs> okay. <coughs> excuse me. We're going to take this one person at a time. Okay, please, we're going to have a question from back here. Go ahead. Okay, it's my turn. <laughs> I've lived, I'm going on my 31st year from living on the corner right there. And I call this Singer Island SeaWorld. I have seen dolphins and their babies training. We, yesterday, the other day I counted 32 manatees in our backyard. So, I mean, I have so many concerns about this. I'm very open to having that meeting with you. I don't want to take up that time here, but everything that my neighbors are saying is true. It has been, it's peaceful. I have had one boat out there that I've called every single top shelf person in this county and everyone passed me to someone else. Not one person could help me. My husband and I have felt in danger of people out there. Nobody has monitored, you know. But what I'm just want, my, my question really is, if you have this, okay, moorings, what happens to the people that want to come in and anchor? Are they, they going can. to be able to anchor they will not around? Be able no, to they can't. No. Okay, so, all right. I'm so, designing the field with the setbacks that there will be no place for them to anchor. Even alongside the actual west coast, like the very west part of it that is in front? Because what will happen is some boats will go right out in front, right between the channel. We have, uh, we set, we went right up to the right away setback of the ICW just to make sure, and that's why we kind of moved it out there and moved it up. Because if they go out beyond there, they're either going to be in the channel or they're going to be wide open all the time. And we found most of these boats do not want to do that. Well, you some will. Right yeah. We need to make sure that, that the field is, is big enough, the 125 feet goes all the way up to the shore of those of those houses and, and the condominium, because they will anchor 10 feet off your dock. Don't They've done it. Also remember that the 125 is from the perimeter of the mooring field that we define, and then the boats will be back from it, the actual moorings. Yeah. But my point was to bring it up to put into your awareness that when you have these restrictions, what's going to happen? There's going to be other, it's just going to trickle. So just put that into your awareness. When you're we always Thank have you. that. And that was when we did, when we did the five pilot programs, that was one of the things we wanted to see. Because every one of those mooring fields were put where most boats anchored in those five communities. So. They came up with anchoring restrictions that went out, you know, quarter mile, half a mile here, there, and elsewhere. So the question in the pilot program was, all right, so you had 70 boats in that particular area. Where did those 70 boats go? How many went out of the mooring field? That was the first thing. How many stayed in that community and found somewhere in the community that didn't have an anchoring restriction that they could go? or they disappeared and we didn't know where they went. Um, we had a little bit of everything in that process. I mean, you always, people that enjoy their boat or don't want to lose it. I mean, I would never leave my boat on anchor at 300, I mean, because we get too many 65 mile an hour thunderstorms that come through. And most people, if they care about their boat, are not going to lose it when you're paying on a mooring, granted, you're having to pay something, but your boat's pretty safe. I mean, because we're going to check everything, you know, the cleats to make sure there's adequate cleats on the bow and whatever. Those are all going to be in the management plan of who's responsible. No different than our city marina, we look at that. Okay, wait, excuse me, wait, wait. We have a question here, and then I'll come back to you. Hi. I actually, I had a statement. Um, I'm in the minority here. I'm a sailor, and we've used most of the mooring fields in other parts of Florida. We normally anchor on our own anchor, and I'm in favor of mooring fields because they do make things better rather than worse, and we hear a lot of comments about, well, who's going to control this, who's going to control that? I may be wrong, but it's my, what I've heard is this is federal water out there. So really, the city has no control of the water. It's federal water as it stands. It's, and it's, it's state. It's let me explain to you. There's state waters. That bottom land belongs to the state of Florida. 
we will define that, what you saw in these drawings, right. that perimeter will become a lease. And that bottom land will be leased to the city of Riviera Beach for this activity. And to go along with that will be our management plan and everything that goes along with it. So the governor and cabinet sitting as trustees of state lands understands that this is a good alternative to put in use of that because you're going to deny everybody else's use except that they can motor through it. But other than that, they can't anchor her and whatever. And that, so it's got to go through that process. And then after that, that management plan is all part of the lease. You know, if government doesn't do or even free enterprise, all your marinas, all for whether private city or whatever, most of the lands in the state of Florida belong to the state, submerged lands. And every single activity like that, with the exception of a single family dock that is less than a certain number of square feet, requires a lease. Back here, Joe. Okay, I, I have a few questions in relation to some of the comments that have already been made. Um, the first one is, uh, in relation to what you said about our marine life, I also see our manatees floating by, swimming, families of manatees. Am I right to assume that you've already done some sort of a marine life environmental study? Has that been done so far? That's, that's done all the time. DEP, that's why in speed zones, that's taken into consideration with sailboats because they don't, uh, they permit marinas and whatever that just have sailboats extremely easy compared to powerboats. Why? Because when that sailboat leaves, it only goes five knots. It doesn't go 40. Uh, so the manatee rules are basically set and sailboats can do a great many things that powerboats can't. You've got water flushing, fantastic. They don't have anywhere to swim. It's fantastic. These boats are, sailboats do not come and go like, most of these boats at anchor, how often do you see them leave? You're going to have very few power boats. If you take a look at mooring fields, go down to Miami, I would say there isn't 5% on the mooring field that okay. could be trawlers and considered power boats, but most power boat owners like electricity and they don't want to use generators. Okay. All right. And they like their marinas for all the activity. Mm -hmm. Those that like sailboats like it peaceful and quiet and they're generally out on anchor or they prefer moorings. Um, yeah. As one that has been woken up in the middle of the night, worrying whether or not you're dragging because you're on anchor in the Bahamas or whatever, uh, when you can wake up and then be remembered that you're on a mooring and not an anchor and then you go back to sleep. Um, it's just, uh, they're very secure. They're designed for high winds for certain size boats and that's what they're designed to hold. I, so I, I live in the condo in Sugar Sands and the, that picture on, on the top right. Uh, and I live on the first floor, so I have a wonderful view of the project. And for some weird reason, every morning when I have my coffee, I count the boats. So I can tell you there's never less than 20, there's never more than 30, and your 5% of the motorboats is probably right on. There's, I think, three that are fully occupied, uh, live year-round on them, but one guy seems to go on jobs or something for a long time. My biggest concern, I think there's, there's some at attributes here, obviously, in terms of cleanliness and, and revenue for the city, but what I'm just, I think is gonna affect the quality of life out there like nothing else, is with just two, of those two voters, we got them, they were there before, I've only been there for six years, they were there before me, I bought into it, I understand it. But I can't believe with this number of boats that we're not gonna have a significantly higher number of people spending the night out on that water. And, and when that takes place, I'm, I'm telling you, you, you can sit in your lanai, you can go to bed with the window open, and I can hear the one guy, okay, who's out there right now living on his boat. If, if you increased it to 10, it would be annoying, let alone if you increase it, to, I know, out of 113, even if you only got 80 and it was only occupied with 60, and of the 60, only 30 of them were out there for the night. I just think it would affect the quality of life on Sugar Sands to absolutely, to, I, to know. I, listen, I am hearing clear the concerns based on that. 
and I will tell you, I mean, I have a, one of my bosses is to the right, <laughs> and I have another boss on my left-hand side. So, um, you know, I hear you loud and clear, and we will take a very careful look at that. My, my second part, this is probably more de defeatist to me, but as long as on the south side you have this big future expansion area, you, which you don't know if you're going to need, right? Because you South side where? Your future the expansion area. The no, that picture right there. Oh. That picture right there has a, an expansion area, okay? I'm not sure I know what you're talking about. Oh, where the... Yeah. The future expansion area, okay? Yeah, so if yeah, you... We can, we, can no, no, yeah. we can shift... For starters. We can cut boats, we can shift some of them more that way. Yeah, I'm just saying we don't know if we're going to need the expansion area, so why start with everything jammed at Sugar Sands when you can put them out there? Right. So if I, I want to make... The thing is, though, they're going to move everything south. The voters that aren't going to pay are going to be right up next to you guys anyway. See, the problem is, is how do I... I mean, when I did that, I did that for shoreline expansion. Now, if you're an anchored out guy, you're going to try and have me for lunch. Because I'm telling you, I designed these mooring fields to protect your properties, the mainland and what's in that cove, to make sure that no boats, because all the ones that went in your seawall, they weren't on moorings, they were anchored. And that's why they went in the seawall. We won't have those either because I've got my side scanning sonar showed up two things. Number one, I can tell you every anchor damage, exactly where it is, how deep it is, how deep the scour is in detail with the side scanning multi-beam uh, sonar. But if it's an anchor, I can tell you it's anchor. If it's an engine block, whatever's on that bottom, we've got a clear picture of it. So that'll all take into account. Uh, but everything, these, when... All there is is a shaft that sticks up from the bottom with a knot, and everything connects from that and goes up. When you're not using it, you snap a little buoy to it with a little pendant that goes up, so you can find the mooring easier when you're coming down to snap it back in. And when the mooring's not been used, there's nothing there except for that eye sticking up and that little buoy. Okay, we have a question back here. Next, John. Sorry, I'll come back to you. Hi. I don't want people to touch it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, hi, I also live on um, next to Sugar Sands in a single family home next to the person you were just speaking to. And I hear the man clearing his throat in the morning, the same guy that you hear in the evening. And the noise is unbelievable just from boats passing up and down because we keep our doors open. And the noise factor early in the morning, not so much except for that one man. And at night, there's a lot of music and a lot of things happening. So I think all of us came here concerned about the 25, what we call, derelict boats. So why can't we use law enforcement? I mean, I'm sure there's Florida statutes that require them to have a waste out, whatever, waste management They're, they're type not of thing. supposed to discharge. I know, but wait. But yeah. wait, wait. All right. So why can't we, if they're not supposed to, then they're obvious, obviously violating some Florida statute. So why not handle it that way in the meantime instead of adding 113? And talk about quality of life issues. I think that's really... You have to catch the boat discharging. So first of all, sewage discount comes out the bottom of the boat. Well, that's just one example. I mean, you can... You it, probably it, could. I mean, you could probably... Anyway, that's all I have to say. I was originally in favor of it. Now I'm terribly opposed to it. I'm going to go here and come back. This gentleman hasn't spoken yet. I'm trying to get to people who haven't spoken yet first. Yes, my, my opinion of the, of the field is, is mainly good. Uh, if it does everything that you say it does, then it will control the environment. I don't see how that little thing that curlies up and goes down into the ground is going to hold a boat during a storm or a hurricane. They play so high I, don't have faith, I don't have faith in that. I don't understand why the city of River Beach uh, doesn't uh, uh, try to legislate uh, better regulations so that what we have can get better, not add more. Okay. Tomorrow, tomorrow, um, Wednesday night of this week, if you're watching the council meeting, we have the first reading of a, an ordinance that will help us regulate floating structures that will include 
live awards and it will include it. So please watch that. Please see if we pass it on first reading and then we'll have a second reading and so on. So we're moving in that direction. We're moving toward trying to regulate. And with regard to uh, the police boat going around, we only have jurisdiction over certain areas of the waterway. And I don't want to get into too much detail about that, but uh, there are places out there that we cannot interact with the boaters, so that, that's a problem. Now, who was next over here? You spoke once. Yeah. Did anyone not speak yet? Who, this, and then I'll come back. I just want to give everybody a chance to speak who hasn't yet spoken. Hello. Yeah, I live on the east side of, of the north field in the houses. Now, you talk about 150 feet from the seawall, but what, everybody has docks in there that are it was like 250 feet to the perimeter of the mooring field to your docks. And then on top of that, the boats are Well, the in, boat's going to take up part of the space. Inside the... And then you've got the 40 feet of docks that are out there. So it, it really doesn't add up. And you're talking about sugar sand. Are they going to be restricted from building any docks that they want to build over there? My understanding is they can't build because the Riparian is on the east side going this way because that was artificially built, same as the... the you know, uh, I, we had derelict boats in our property. It took a week. Sheriff's Department came out, said nothing we can do about it, not our responsibility. And they sat there and sat there and sat there and sat there. They said when they, when they go to court with the people, the judge just... They say, oh, well, our boat got loose because it was broke down and we ordered parts. It gives them another 30 days. So none of this makes any sense, okay? That's people, why... People, people talk about insurance. You don't, nobody's going to have insurance. You know, we have rental property in West Palm Beach. People, they, they get insurance and they pay by the month. So every two months you get a, you get a cancellation notice and then they pay the, the $50 or whatever they're going to pay, and then they reinstate it, and then it goes back and forth. So they only got insurance for the, the two or three weeks that they actually pay for it. The rest of the time, if there's any damage, you've got no insurance. It's why we're doing the mooring field, because the boat's anchored out there in the waters today. There are no controls on them whatsoever. Anyone who hasn't yet spoken, have you, you have not yet spoken. Maybe this is a stupid question, but the 25 boats that are there now, what's going to happen to them? They will do one of two things. They'll either, they'll either pass the regulations so they can come in the mooring field, or they're going to have to go somewhere else. Well, they can't pay for the mooring fields, that's for sure. They what? They will not pay. Then they're going to go somewhere else. So how are you going to get rid of them? Well, they won't be there. Because it will arrest them. That's, yeah, that's an easy. How do you get rid of them? We'll arrest so that we'll, now, will our, that's a good question. Because will the, our marine the land patrol will be leased to the okay. city for recreation and controls that are approved as part of the permit process under proprietary. We can't even get rid of but that's because stops. we don't we don't have that. We can't even get rid of stops along the highway. Oh, oh, that worked at, that's, that's, that's all uh, things in, <laughs> we'll it's, not it's not, it's, there, it's in totally, it's, it's not that easy to get rid of a boat that's sitting there, and it's been, and it's been sleeping there for 15 years. What are you going to do with the, uh, with the, uh, the big one, the, the uh, two-masted uh, schooner? What's going to happen to that boat? It's been there probably for 100 years. I don't know where you're talking that's about. Oh, you mean in, in that all the boats, that era, whole entire area would come underneath the lease. The boats either one of two things, vacate or pass the regulation and come into the mooring field. I understand that. It's going to be there illegally. There, and I'll come back, I promise. <laughs> I promise. All right, we, we, we will finally have jurisdiction, yes. as I understand it. Yes. We don't have jurisdiction now. That's part of the problem. And based on the lease, will have the city can do an ordinance, and then they have police powers to tell them to vacate. If they don't vacate, they will get arrested. Okay. Right, we have a question back here. 
Yes, a uh, couple of questions. Number one, um, they had mentioned, uh, Marie had mentioned about the pump out of these boats that are out there right now. And obviously that's a, a, a mandatory thing, but it is hard to police, I believe that. But shouldn't all these boats have to pass all safety standards, whether they're flare kits, whether they're those life are, those proper are life preservers? Because I know this, I have um, a 60-foot sport fish boat, and uh, at least three times a year I'm stopped. They want to see all my things. We, we, we always have all our ditch bag ready to go. Um, and I can tell you I've never been fined because I always keep in compliance. So every one of those boats out there, whether they're in this lagoon, whether they're by Peanut Island, they should all have to be passed with the compliance of the state of the law. That's all there is to it. Secondly, um, any of these boats, in my opinion, when there is a named storm, should have to move. That's that every marina on Singer Island, if you're, all the boats have to clear out of there. So in my opinion, an easy solution would be and a name storm comes, all the boats have to be pushed, you know, all the boats have to go away. So and that would an be an easy solution, and that could be policed fairly and easily. Let me tell you what happens with that. they got to go away, and then they're going to go out on, on any waters that are that are a quarter mile away, and they will all anchor out everywhere, and every single boat will wind up in somebody's front yard that's a waterfront homeowner. Well, but, you know, where, are you, where are they going to go to? Well, I agree with you. Um, I can tell you right now, again, my insurance policy on my big sport fish boat, I have to have a hurricane plan. I mean, I, otherwise, I don't get insurance. So I have a hurricane plan that's, that I have to fill out every year. And mind you, I have a 39-foot outboard boat as well that I have to have a hurricane plan for that little boat. So with that being said, why wouldn't every one of these boats have to have a hurricane plan? So therefore, at least... At least they know, um, or at least the city should know, I should say, what's going on. And um, that will be part of the management plan that you will have to fill out the same sure. as when you come with a marina, give us the proof of your insurance and all I, the different I things. Would, I would assume that this idea theor theoretically should, should um, attract a better client. Correct. Um, so I, I see the idea. Um, although um, I have a very nice home inside the lagoon there, and I got to tell you something, I've seen not one nice boat in that area ever, and they're all horrible. And um, I got to tell you something, that I tell you, if the Coast Guard went to every one of those boats, every one of those boats would fail and not comply. That's, that's all I have to say. And we just had five of those come into the city of marina, and it's going to cost 41000 and change to, sure. to take them out. I, uh, Why aren't the owners paying for that? You can put them in jail. Uh, you know, most of those, they don't have any money. That's why we want to get rid of them. And, and the idea is to separate them enough from the boats that are capable of navigation and will wind up in the mooring field. And then every year we've been passing more legislation, you know, the one now where they've got to prove that they're in navigation. You know, and then the other time is ducking them. Half of these boats have been sold 20 times on the back of a napkin. There isn't even a valid, I, I mean, unfortunately, once in a while, they wind up with a resident. The best case I know of was 285-year-old people that were up north, and they had to go down to the Keys to prove that they had sold the boat, because under state law, if you sell your boat, you have to notify the state that you sold it and who you sold it to. Doesn't often happen. I, I have, uh, he wanted some statistics, and I just happen to have them with me. Uh, this is a letter that was sent to Commissioner um, Karen Marcus way back in 2005. In 2004, when the storm hit, I was able to research back to other mooring fields in two in Vero Beach and two in Stewart. These are planned and well-executed mooring fields engineered for the boats that were there. Go ahead. There's only one engineer to prove mooring field, and that's the one by the... By these by at the, the time, bridge. these at the time were done so that none of the boats would break loose. I'll just give you two, two statistics. In Vero Beach, there were 57 moorings 
they lost 13 boats. In Stewart, there were 86 moorings. They lost 74 boats. Some of them because of chafe lines, some of them because of this chain breaking loose. Most were from anchored out boats that went through the mooring field and caught the moorings with their anchors, and some to the tune of two or three vessels all pulling on the same mooring as the boat that was they on still it. still broke loose. Because of the anchored out boats. Hmm? And that's why we're trying to increase the distances that boats can anchor from our infrastructures. But what has it changed now? If you have 25 boats that continue to be there anchored on kite strings, that's better? No, you should have stayed on it. You guys have the worst mooring situation Which we're trying. And well, it's, they're all on mooring field. I have a question back here, and then I'll come back here. Okay, let's just do this first. Hi, is there going to be 24 hour security? No. So I live at Sugar Sands on the first floor, and people are out partying until 1 o'clock in the morning on those boats. How do I take care of that? How do I know that nobody's going to come up on my patio? How do you know they're not going to come up on their patio from who knows where in a boat now? I don't. Okay, we have another question back here now. We, we have another question back here. Um, okay. My biggest question is around, you keep referring to the management plan, the management plan, the management plan. I'm not familiar with you. I don't know what your lengthy history with the city of Riviera Beach is. Um, the city has a real problem with executing anything. And so my biggest concern, you know, and I would like to make an appointment with yourself, have Mr. Evans, Dr. Botel, and my immediate neighbors join me. I'm, on, I'm one of the single family homeowners. Based on your drawing, it is evident that the motivation is, to, is for the city and not for the people that are directly being impacted by this. It's merely in the fact that I see the future expansion area is an area where nobody lives. However, you've got everything backed up to our backyards you have an extremely wide channel that you have just mentioned is not going to be regulated by the city of Riviera Beach. I deal with, with an issue out here almost on a monthly basis. There's no one to call. Everybody passes the buck, so now it falls into this channel. And you're, you keep referring to the management plan, but be, we, well, we, we have a problem with executing. I will tell you, I am the one that emailed you about not receiving a flyer. I cannot get information from the city. There is nothing, there, there's no information on the website. It's, I hate to say it, but we're in a shambles right now, and this is a great idea, but I don't see that the city is in a place that we can manage this. Commissioner Botel, yeah. part of why we're doing this is, you know, we haven't applied, there, there are no official plans into the permit agencies yet. This is what, the third, uh, I think that's the third workshop we've had. And there's going to be more trying to get as much input before we finalize them and submit them. Because, you know, once they get submitted, things have had to be a little more cast in, in whatever. Um, but when you talk about that, that's why in the state law it defines a lease. So law enforcement, our water patrol boat, based on the distance, if a boat anchors in that area, they will be able to enforce it. Today, there's nothing they can enforce because the only way you can prevent the anchoring is that they cannot anchor in a mooring field and they can anchor within a certain distance of mooring field. And those are the only two things that you can do to prevent anchoring in the state of Florida, well, basically. It, you're correct. So, and they can't, they need a lease to actually put their own engine block down, which none of them, to the best of my knowledge, have. Yes, I, I had a concern. I had a concern about the open liability. If the city owned the mooring and then become landlord in charge of the fee, so if the boat did damage to the seawall or to any other boat, um, the passing boat or something, then 
the I mean, city of Riviera Beach is going to assume a liability as a landlord. So, I mean, we are a uh, resident in this city, so we're going to, you know, chip up the, the cost. So that's, I uh, have another concern because of the, for the management, then I think that's uh, just for the fee. So it's a cost effective. That means really to collect those fee and really outweigh the, the potential liability damage. Okay. Now, I want to get around again because I know there. So I'm going to start this direction because I have completely lost track of who is next. So I got to do it this way. You're good. Well, city always, I mean, you know, it'd be nice to have a city that doesn't have liability, but it does. Uh, to a lot of things, it does. No the, different than the city marina or whatever. Um, I mean, docks fail and whatever. It's part of doing business, and generally the policies, I'm quite sure the city manager will work with their risk companies, and they will figure out how to take care of that as part of the mooring field. We, we, um, have, we have liability for sidewalks and streets. doesn't mean we stop building them. Th that's just an inherent risk. Of we would assume whatever responsibility would be associated with that, but we would have to work with legal and risk management. And, and one thing I do want to say is that this is the beginning steps of the, This is the beginning steps of a process that has to go before the legislative body as well as having appropriate conversations with the community. So this is merely the starting point. I highly doubt that we end up at this particular um, end result, but that's why we're having these types of conversations because we need to hear the feedback and perspective with regards to what the community wishes to see. This is not something that Jonathan Evans, the city manager, or chairperson Botel can wave a magic wand and it happens tomorrow. Plus, there's a whole bunch of regulatory agencies that we need to work with. We know that there's an issue and there's a problem. There's a way for us to look at trying to address that, but it's going to take incremental steps to effectively do that. But at the end of the day, it's going to take three elected officials to vote this in. And so I know that the elected officials, and I know Chair Botel wants to see this something that is five elected officials voted in because that provides us more guidance and direction. Right now, our law enforcement assets, and we've probably emailed with some of you about multiple issues out on the waterway. We are very limited and restricted with regards to our ability to enforce our local ordinances as well as some of the state laws because of some of the challenges associated with the waterways and how people have certain rights. And you better believe it that the state legislature and the folks that have boats make sure that they advocate for laws that protect boats, good, bad, or indifferent. And so it is trying to thread that needle going 90 miles an hour. But we're trying to work through the nuances of this to be able to address it because I can tell you our law enforcement officers get a lot of calls, try to go out there and address people, but then they have constitutional protections, unlawful search and seizure, somebody's constitutional Fourth Amendment. So we try to do what we can do, and we're limited, and this provides us a little bit of a mechanism to gain compliance, and John Sprague and his team have done an exceptional job with regards to taking our marina, which was a loss for the city, of a about $300,000 a year to where it's now a profit center for the city and making improvements. So we're not perfect, but we want to get better. And we can get to a point that conceivably the community can say, hey, this, this makes sense, this doesn't make sense. But realize that this is merely the first step in the conversation. And I can envision that there will be multiple discussions with the community at your community center, in front of the board. And this is such a heavy item that the hurricane plan, great idea, the liability, the, there's, some, there's a lot of great ideas that are coming out of these conversations and I can anticipate that additional you know, ideas will come out of it. So we may not get it perfect, but at least we can get it to where everyone can understand the expectation and maybe it's a gradual approach. Maybe this is phase C or phase three and we go with subsequent phases and we show our ability to manage that mooring field and then ultimately move on after we've shown
that, hey, this can be a successful endeavor for the city to move forward. So I just wanted to say that. I'm taking notes. I'm hearing a lot of comments, a lot of great ideas. I've got to talk with risk management and legal and those types of things. But this is merely the first step in the process. One thing I would like to encourage us, and we can do this if you haven't signed in, so we can have your email address, so we can make sure that you're getting information, that we can keep you informed of when the policy makers are going to be having this discussion, because we don't want to get it to a point where it goes before the elected body and that you all don't know what's going on, and then you find out something's passed after the fact. Uh, we want to encourage transparency and involvement, and we, we want to make sure that you're involved in the decision-making process, because at the end of the day, it's not Jonathan Evans that's going to hear the guy clearing his throat in the morning. It's, it's going to be you all. And so we want to be conscientious of that and try to, you know, make this as good of a public policy as we certainly can. And we have no problem with going out to other entities that have done this and bringing them in and actually getting videos of how those um, mooring fields are operating. And with regards to, and real quick, and I'll, and I'll give the mic back to, to John, uh, with respect to people discharging, um, our top cop, he was in here, the chief of police was in here, but uh, eventually folks have to discharge their waste and, and we probably can work with uh, PBSO as well as our marine unit and some other partners to see if we can catch some of those bad actors that are out there uh, contaminating the environment uh, with regards to that. So I'll, I'll have a further in-depth conversation and, and we can see if we can sit on people and to the gentleman's point, go in to see if we can just uh, tap on the window and see if people have some of the safety things that they need to be, that they need, need to have to, to navigate a vessel out there. So uh, it's a lot of great information and we're taking it all in, but we definitely want to keep the lines of communication open so the policymakers can know all the information and that you all please participate through the process, through the, through the community conversations, through the first reading, through the second reading of the ordinance, and making sure that you, in fact, hold us accountable. When we say we're going to do X, Y, and Z, that we effectively put that in the policy to do X, Y, and Z. And anything that we enforce or anything we put in the policy, we have to be able to enforce it. So as far as things that are nebulous out there, we need to be able to grab onto that and be able to say, so I can tell Officer Summers or the Marine unit, hey, we need to go ahead and enforce this, and here's the mechanisms to do that, and this is exactly what the problem is because we don't want to put our officers in you know, in that gray area, because they don't operate well in that gray area, so. Um, but th this is a lot of great feedback, and I just want to let you know, this is early on in the process. This is not a done deal. This has not gotten to a, an agenda. This is merely a conversation, and I'm sure the other colleagues of Councilperson Botel are watching this meeting, and, and I would encourage you to keep, you know, uh, keep, keep track of this, and we'll definitely make sure that um, it's done in a transparent way so you can be involved in the process. And I want to say thank you, Jonathan. <clears throat> I pride myself in, in being a good communicator. So when I heard today that somebody had not heard about this meeting, I apologize and I, I encourage you, if you have not given Mr. Brown over here your email address, please do so because I send out regular emails to the people on my, on my list. And if you haven't, if you're not signed up for Nextdoor, Nextdoor is a great way to communicate. I communicate a lot of information through that as well as through my Facebook page. So please do that. With whom should I work to set up a meeting at Sugar Sands? Vic? Vic. Vic work directly with Vic? Okay. I, will, I pledge that I'm going to work with Vic to set up a meeting at the Sugar Sands Clubhouse in the next couple of weeks where John can come again. And we can continue to have these conversations to refine this plan and to, and to make whatever changes you think are appropriate. Thank you again for coming this evening. I promised I wouldn't take you more than an hour and a half. I appreciate your attention. Thank you. We will also list all of your questions and kind of put them in because why I so Oh, great. Got Mr. Evans captured some of those. Good. Go yeah. Okay. Really quick, uh, we'll put out some information on our website. Uh, we're going to be keeping track of the questions because we want to be able to address all those questions at subsequent meetings. So I'll okay. work with Chair Botel to get that out. Thanks. And that out. Thanks very much. Thank you. Have a good night. Be safe. Thank you.